I'm blessed to be able to have uh, the Encyclopedia of Judaica on my computer. It is very, very helpful with a lot of the backgrounds of Hebrew words and, and Jewish doctrine, or even biblical doctrine. Okay, let's go to the book of Genesis, please, as they're handing these papers out. In Genesis 1, verse 1. And then we'll go to verse 26, Genesis 1. Tonight, we're going to focus on the plural terms. Plural terms for God. <clears throat> God is numerically one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Echad, one Lord. One numerically. Not just in unity, and definitely not unity of persons, but one numerically and also in unity. You understand? Echad, the word echad, or the one, when you study that word, it speaks of numerical oneness. It also speaks of unity. But in the context of Deuteronomy 6, it's, it's speaking to you of uh, the numerical unity of God. The new numerical oneness of God. That He is one God. And in the word echad, again, because <clears throat> listen to me very carefully. Trinitarians try to say that the word one there simply means oneness in unity. But it is oneness not only in unity, it is oneness in new number. And the word itself has no room for separate anything. Okay? No room at all in the Hebrew word. I studied the word today. There is no room at all in that word, even if it does mean unity, even if it did mean that, there is no room for separate anything in the word. <clears throat> you with me here? Okay. We're going to talk then about if God is one numerically, and the Trinitarians will say He's one numerically. But what they say is that there are three persons of the Godhead in Him, within Him, within the one God, there are three separate persons. We're going to see if that's true biblically. And they take terms, plural terms, and they say something like this. I'm not going to keep you standing all night, but they'll say, well, we expect to, as Trinitarians, because we believe that there's one God, to see terms that speak of oneness or singleness you understand but then they turn around and say also because we believe that there are three persons in that one god we expect to see plural terms concerning god and because they come across certain plural terms concerning god plural names of god plural terms concerning god they automatically interject well that's the trinity of persons that's not true We'll try to prove it by the word of the Lord tonight, okay? Genesis 1. And we have to do that by, by showing you the names of the Lord. But Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God. Say God. God. The Hebrew word is Elohim. It is a plural word. Okay? Not a singular word. A plural word. So again... We don't believe in three separate persons, but somebody who would believe in separate persons will look at that word God Elohim and say, okay, it's plural. So that means there must be one, more than one person in the Godhead. Okay? In the beginning, God, Elohim, plural, created the heaven and the earth. Go to verse 26. <clears throat> and God, or Elohim, plural, said... Let us, let us, look at that, a plural term, plural word, Elohim, plural term, us. Let us make man in our, plural term, our. Let us make man in our image after our likeness, plural term again. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. 
So God created man in his image. You see that? So God, Elohim, plural, plural, created man in his singular image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Okay? Let's go over to chapter 2, please. Chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, okay? The Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate or meat for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them into Adam to see what he would call them. Whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Let's jump down. Verse 21. And the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, had taken from man, made he a woman. Okay. The rib that he took from Ish, he made a Isha. He took the rib from Ish and he made an Isha and brought her unto the man. So where did Isha come from? Isha came out of Ish. So that in Ish, the man Adam was Isha, the woman. So at this point, Adam was androgynous, having both male and female attributes inside of him. Are you with me here? Doesn't mean that he's two. It doesn't mean he's a plural person. It just means he's got the attribute of a man and he's got the attribute of a womb, a womb man or a woman inside of him. You understand? And when God created man in his image, how many men did he create? How many? One. He created man in his image. Single. In his image. So even the creation of that one man declares to you that there's one God. That one God created that one man, but in that one man there was a woman on the inside of her. Didn't make Adam two, nor does it make God two to say, let us make man. We're going to explain that to you if we can tonight. Father, we bless you right now. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise for your wonderful word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. <clears throat> Let's go through the names of God. These names are... <clears throat> transliterations from the Hebrew. And I say transliteration because if this was Hebrew, it would not look like that. Okay? So a translation, or I mean a transliteration is when you have the Hebrew word transliterated, the letter to, that corresponds in the English. The letter in the English that corresponds to the Hebrew letter is a transliteration, okay? So these words, you don't see them in Hebrew form right now, but they are the transliteration of the Hebrew word, okay? On your paper there, names are titles of God in the Old Testament. Just because you have God with many different names or titles does not mean that there is more than one God. God revealed himself to mankind at different times by different names. These names here are not all of his names. There are 72 names of God. You with me? 72. And I'm talking about literal names, okay? I'm not talking about 
uh, you know, where he's called the rock or whatever. You know what I'm saying? But names, 72 different names of God. So this is not an exhaustive list by any means. Names or titles of God. El. Say El. El. <coughs> El. God means strength, mighty, or almighty. Okay? Eloa. Eloa. Notice. Eloa is an extension of the name El. You, we've heard the term El Shaddai. You know what I'm talking about? You got a compound word there, El, and then you got Shaddai. So El, God, Shaddai. And we'll talk about that. But El, say God. El. And then Eloa is the lengthened form of El. Okay, with me here? Eloah is not used very often in the Bible. It is used mostly in the book of Job. Eloah is feminine. Did you hear what I said? It is feminine. Female character. So what is it going to do? Then it's going to describe a female characteristic of God. Doesn't mean God is a woman. Remember, God is not a man and God is not a woman. God is a spirit. But he has many names or many titles. And those names and titles reveal something about his nature or his character or his dealing with us. So L, starting now, L, God, strength, might, almighty. Then you have Eloah. This is God. This is from El. It's on your paper. Means the adorable one. And because it's got an A-H on the end of it, it is feminine. Interesting. So God, who is a spirit, is going to reveal a feminine characteristic about himself by that name. That particular word, Eloah, primarily has to do with breath. It is primarily connected to anointing. So in the Old Testament, Eloah is a good name for the Holy Ghost or God moving in Holy Ghost activity. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? In the Old Testament, Eloah, the spirit, the breath, the anointing of God is feminine. In the New Testament though, Holy Ghost is not in the feminine term. It is in the masculine term. Because in the Old Testament, Eloah is God sort of in a female characteristic, adorable one. But in the New Testament, he's more active. He's more Aggressive. Okay, now I'm just giving you this information. Don't look at me like a tree full of owls. Female. You with me here? Still talking about the one God who's a spirit. Female characteristic. And then we have Elohim. Elohim is the plural form of Eloah. The plural form of Eloha. Eloah. Eloah and Elohim are lengthened forms of El. Okay, and you can get all of this on that paper I gave you, that documentation I just gave you, except for certain things I've said about the names, okay? Then you go down, okay, Elohim, let's talk about Elohim. Elohim is a name for God in creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Elohim created the heavens and the earth. God said, let us make man in our image. Elohim said, let us make man in our image. Elohim is androgynous. Elohim is a, is a plural word for God. It is a plural name of God that is androgynous, which means this. This name, Elohim, shows you both characteristics of one God. That is why it is plural. 
because it shows you God in his female characteristics and it shows you God in his male characteristics. That's why it's androgynous. So it has to be plural form. It has to be. Because androgynous means having both characteristics. Are you with me here? Amen. Next word. Y-H-V-H. This came out of, out of this uh, course on one God. I don't really... I mean, sometimes people are tra- uh, will, will say Y-H-W-H, but it's yod hey vav hey. It really should be translated Y-H-V-H. yod hey vav hey. Y'all have heard us say, make reference to that? Or sometimes pronounce Yahweh. Okay? This name here is masculine. Yahweh is masculine. This is God in His masculine nature or characteristic Yahweh say Yahweh Yahweh. it means self-existent one or eternal one literally means he is okay you with me masculine another term another name for God still same God El Elyon Means the most high God. You heard the term most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. So Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and then as El Elyon, he possesses it. <clears throat> Y'all up with me up to this point? Say El Elyon. El Yel El Elyon is also androgynous. Means this name of God is depicting God in both male and female characteristics. El Elyon. Ooh, glory to God, man. I'm just feeling real good right now. Then another, another term you're familiar with, you heard God, his name El Shaddai. El Shaddai. Say El Shaddai. El Shaddai is feminine means the breasted one you're telling me god's got breasts no he's showing you a characteristic of himself he is el shaddai the breasted one okay feminine now watch this are y'all still awake out there When you go through these names, let me give you also what the actual name means. Eliyayan means head. Watch the body here. It means head. yod hey vav hey The yod means hand. Right? Hand. Elohim. Means rump. Say rump. And I mean rump. Okay, we got the head, we got the hand, we got the rump. Eloah also means rump. Because again, remember, Elohim is the plural form of Eloah. So it means rump also. Okay, you with me here? Very interesting then, we have El Shaddai, and El Shaddai means breast. Now, are y'all, y'all with me up to this point? When you talk then about the nature of God, you have certain terms that are singular and certain terms that are plural. Why is that? It is not teaching you that there are a, a multiple personality or a multi, multi-personal God. Do you understand? I'm not up there. I'm not over there. I'm up here. I'm giving you very important information. This, when you talk about let us, God create, are you with me here? Or Elohim in a plural form. People will say that means that, well, he's multiple, multi-personal. He's multiple persons in the Godhead. 
the Bible does not teach that. And we're going to try to explain to you tonight some very important things. Let me deal with number one, Yahweh. Or yod Hey vav Hey. Now, if you look in Genesis 2 and verse 7... The Bible says, and the Lord God, or Yahweh Elohim, yod Hey vav Hey Elohim, formed man out of the dust of the ground. Go over with me to Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6, and beginning with verse 1, notice what the Bible says. Exodus 6, 1. Now. I know you like preaching. I like to preach. But tonight we're teaching. Don't shut your brain off. Exodus 6, 1. Then the Lord, all capitalized there. If you look in a concordance called Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, you look under the word Lord there and... Exodus 6 verse 1, the transliterated Hebrew word behind Lord is Yehovah. Yehovah. Say with me, Yehovah. Yehovah. Of which it, it is changed, given a J, and that's where we get the term Jehovah. Okay? But, literally, then the Lord, or yod Hey vav Hey said unto Moses, sometimes translated Yahweh, sometimes translated Jehovah. Now, I'm telling you this for a reason. Okay? Then the Lord said unto Moses, now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand, notice that, yod Hey vav Hey, the word literally is connected to hand. So he says, yod hey vav hey said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And Elohim, Elohim, the same God that created the heavens and the earth, and God, or Elohim, spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am yod Hey vav Hey." So Elohim, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the plural name of God, he says, Elohim says, that he is yod Hey vav Hey, Or that he's Yahweh. Right? So we are, the Bible's already told us who Elohim is. Elohim, the creator, God is yod hey vav hey. Okay? He says, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God El. There's El. El. And then Almighty Shaddai. So we found out two things in this passage. We found out that Elohim is Yahweh. And we found out that Elohim is El Shaddai. Elohim is the plural word for God. Yahweh is the masculine name for God. And El Shaddai is the female name for God. So this one God, Elohim, has a plural attribute of female and male in him. And as male, he is Yahweh. And as female, he is El Shaddai. But he is Elohim, the one God of the Bible. So it's not teaching you by these names that there is a plurality of persons. It's teaching you a nature of God, a characteristic of, uh, an attribute of God, I should say. An attribute of God. A masculine attribute and a feminine attribute of God in the name Elohim. Do you understand that? If you let the Word of God explain itself, you don't have any problems. Now notice what God says. 
The Lord, yod heh vav heh, said to Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let him go, let them go. And with a strong hand shall he drive him out of his land. And Elohim spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am yod heh vav heh. So that plural Elohim said, I am yod heh vav heh, masculine name for God. And I appeared unto Abraham. Say who? Abraham. When did he appear to Abraham? Abraham existed around 2000 B.C. Okay? So he appeared to Abraham by the name of God Almighty or El Shaddai. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. You with me? Now, what we're trying to show you here is, number one, the Bible says that he appeared to Abraham by the name of El Shaddai around 2000 B.C. The scripture also tells us that God spake, or Elohim spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. When did God speak to him that way? Exodus 3, back up. And God said unto Moses, verse 14, I am that I am. I am that I am. Eye esher eye. yod hey vav hey or Yahweh is just a, a shortened form of a longer name. And that's in the documentation I gave you. All right? Let me just go there. Let's look, turn your paper uh, to the last, last page. And, and let me show you here. At the, in the middle paragraph, middle paragraph right here on your page. You have a word, Yahweh, Asher, Yehweh. Yahweh, say, Yahweh. Yah. Yahweh. Yah. Okay. Yahweh. 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 Inhale. Yahweh. Inhale. Yahweh. See? Every time you inhale, Yah. Every time you exhale, So the breathing pattern of all humanity breathes Yahweh. Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. So every time somebody breathes, whether they realize it or not, they're actually calling upon Yahweh. It's a breathing pattern. That's why the name Yahweh, it literally is linked to the word to breathe. They don't even know it. Even the, even the infidels out in the world walk around here. Way, way, way. But that is a shortened form of, it is believed, of a longer name of God. There, Yahweh, Asher, Yehweh. Yeah. Which in Exodus chapter 3 verse 14, when God says, I am that I am, that is, Eye, Asher, Eye. Eye, Asher, Eye. Okay. I am that I am. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. It means the same thing as Yod Hey Bob Hey, the self existent one, the eternal one. Yahweh, masculine God. You understand? So God revealed himself to Moses, Elohim, verse 14, and God said unto Moses, Elohim then reveals himself as I am that I am. Or Eye Asher Eye. Which is just the longer version of yod heh vav -Hey, Or Yahweh. Watch. He tells us here. He says unto Moses, I am that I am. So now he reveals himself to Moses as Yahweh. Or yod heh vav -Hey. I am that I am. The self-existent one. The eternal God. I will be what I will be. I am who I am. You understand? 
eternal God. I am. All right? So then, when you read in Genesis, it said the Lord God. In Genesis 2 and 7, the Lord God. So we have Yahweh God there. Yahweh Elohim there. But in this passage in Exodus, it says by the name Yahweh, God was not known. He was known as El Shaddai in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it wasn't until the days of Moses that God revealed himself as Yahweh. So 2000 BC, God reveals himself to Abraham as El Shaddai. He is Elohim, the creator, but he is El Shaddai. He wants to show Abraham some feminine aspect about himself. Because in those days, they need God to be a nurturer. They need God to be a nourisher. They need God to be a provider. Genesis uses the term Elohim Yahweh. But it is believed that scribes inserted Yahweh there. Because Exodus says that by the name Yahweh, God was not known. Not until the days of Moses, 500 years after Abraham, 1500 years B.C., did God reveal himself as Yahweh, masculine God. He revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the breasted Shaddai. Woo. As the nurturer, the nourishing, providing God. And that's the way they knew him. They knew God that way for a reason. Because it was the formative years. In the formative years, the children... You know, they are very, very close to mama. They look to mama because mama is in the formative years their provider, their nurturer, their caregiver. So in the formative years of the nation of Israel, then God said, I'm your Shaddai. I'm your breasted one. I will provide for you. I will nourish you. I will nurture you. I will care for you like a mother cares for the children. But there's going to come a time, Israel, when you're going to need to know me not as Shaddai, a breasted one. You're going to need to know me as Yahweh. You're going to need to know me as a man. You're going to need a male gender. So God reveals himself, Elohim, plural Elohim, reveals himself to Moses in the masculine term. Now, it's time for you to grow up. You've been nurtured. You've been cared for. You've been nourished. You've been provided for in the formative years. But now you need a daddy to lay down the law. Now you need to know God in a Yahweh form, masculine form, the lawgiver. The one who comes and sets order in the house. The one who brings the law with them. Come on somebody. That, you need to know God that way. The God of covenant. You need to know him as the God of covenant. The, the one who's going to give you the law. The one who is going to lay the order down in the house. You need to know God right now as Yahweh. The victorious, mighty, conquering, warring God. Because you're fixing to enter the covenant with me and you're going into the promised land. And you don't need me as you go into the promised land. You don't need to see me as a, as a, a, a breasted one feeding you and caring for you. You need to see me, God, as the male who has laid down the law and the order. The God of power. The God of victory. The God of conquering ability. You need that kind of God. You need a God that will go in front of you and wipe out the enemy. And the Shaddai characteristic of God, the breasted one, is not the characteristic of power and conquering military order and government. 
So he says, you need to know something about me now that you didn't know about me before. You need to know me as a God of power and a God of victory and a God, come on somebody, a God of order and covenant. But I'm still Elohim. I'm still the creator. I am Elohim, the one God of the Bible. But you need to understand that term is not a plurality of person. That term is showing you a female and also a male aspect of an androgynous God who is a spirit. Give God some praise. So God comes in different times in their life, in different times in your life. Sometimes you need him to be El Shaddai, the nourishing, nurturing, female type God. Sometimes you need him to be a warring God, a conquering God. Sometimes you need to recognize he's king of kings and lord of lords. And then other times you need to recognize his priesthood. Sometimes you need to recognize he is a prophet. Sometimes a priest and then sometimes a king. It just depends on the season that you're in. Are you with me up to this point? So... Exodus 6 shows us that he appeared to Abraham as Shaddai. And then he appeared to Moses as Yahweh. Shaddai, feminine form. Yahweh, masculine form. Come on. But he is still Elohim. He's still the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is El Shaddai. He is God and God alone. Now, if you want to call us Jesus only, I will say this, that he is God and God alone. He is Elohim, he is Yahweh, and he is El Shaddai. That's just only three we're covering tonight. Because the Bible said in Colossians 2, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him. So everything that God is, who he is in nature, who he is by name, who he is by characteristic, who he is by attribute, he is inside of Jesus. Every name. So, if you want to call me Jesus only, then that depends on what you mean if I will accept that. If you mean by that uh, that I only believe in the Son and I don't believe in the Father and the Holy Ghost, then you are unfounded and that is not true. But if when you call me Jesus only, you mean that Jesus Christ is the only God, then you've got it right. Call me Jesus only because he is the only God. He is Elohim creator. He is El Shaddai provider. He is Yahweh, the God of power and covenant. It's all in him. He's the only God. If you don't call me Jesus only and you define me by that term, you got it. Because we believe all the fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus Christ. And that Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are simply activities. Or modes. Or manifestations of that God. And when he acts as the Son. That does not change the fact that he is the Father. Because the Son is his activity or his mode in the present. It's just the particular activity that he's operating in or, or the mode that he's operating at the time doesn't limit him at all. Give God some praise. Not persons, but activities or modes. So you got it right if you don't call me Jesus only. If you define me as believing that in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And that at times he acts, he, he moves and operates in activity as a son. At times he moved as a father. At, so, at times he moves as son. Are you here tonight? Okay, give God some praise. Now going back to the name Yahweh. Yod hey vav hey, masculine. Again, your King James Version, if you have a King James Version, and the New American Standard Version is not any better. 
They translate it the same way, Jehovah. Are you with me? Are you here tonight? But I'm going to show you tonight just for your information. That Jehovah is, the name Jehovah is an erroneous name. To call God Jehovah is not his name. Did you hear what I said? I've got information to back me up. For anybody to say that the name of God is Jehovah, they are in error. Because God's name is not Jehovah. What happened? Well, here we have the scribes, Jewish scribes at times. Are you here tonight? Because they so reverenced the name yod heh vav -Hey. They said it was ineffable. That it was unutterable. That you are not to pronounce that name. yod heh vav -Hey. You're not to say it. Come on. The name. Because of the reverence and the respect that they had for it. They misinterpreted Exodus chapter 20. When it talks about thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. They took an extreme interpretation to that. And they said we won't even pronounce the name. Because we don't want to take the name in vain. It was an extreme interpretation of the Bible. So in the place of at times in your Bible. In the place of yod heh vav -Hey, They substituted or they entered uh, into the place of yod heh vav -Hey, The name Adonai. Say Adonai. Adonai. What happened over a period of time is that they would, they would say the name yod heh vav -Hey, The priests would say it in the temple. But when they walked outside of the temple, they would never pronounce the name yod heh vav -Hey. They would say Adonai. It was because of a strict interpretation of Exodus chapter 20. Are you with me? If we won't pronounce the name of God. The ineffable name, the yod heh vav -Hey. So we'll just say Adonai. Now Adonai is a good name for God in certain places in Scripture. But the problem is they took out yod heh vav -Hey in certain places and inserted Adonai in place of it. And over a period of time, they took, and I'm talking about Jewish scribes, took the vowel points. Because in the Hebrew language, there are no vowels, there are consonants. But there are vowel points given to the, to the names or the words by the Masorites. They put vowel points to show you how to pronounce those words in the Hebrew. Now, don't look at me like this is heavy. This is ba the ABC stuff. What they did, all right, with the consonants, with no vowels, they put vowel points to help them pronounce the word. Okay? What they did to come up with I'm talking about the scribes. What they did to come up with the name Jehovah Ye is they took yod heh vav -Hey and they put Adonai vowel points in the name yod heh vav -Hey. So it is a confounding of the name of God. There is no such thing as Jehovah. There is no name of God, Jehovah. There is no name of God, Jehovah. But when you look in your strongs, it says that it's Jehovah. Why? Because the scribes did that. Because they so reverenced the name of God, they didn't want anybody pronouncing it wrongly. So they said in the place of Jehovah or Yahweh, we'll say Adonai. And it got so extreme that they put the vowel points on Adonai and they put that in yod heh vav -Hey, And they came up with Jehovah. Literally, it would be uh, pronounced Yehovah. 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 They took the Adonai vowel points. So they came up with this hybrid name for God called Jehovah. It is a confounded name. Taking one name of God, Adonai, and putting its pronunciation into the letters of yod heh vav -Hey. That's how they came up with it. Now, go on your paper because I know some of you are starting to freak on me. All right, this is Judaica, in the Encyclopedia of Judaica. This is a large amount of time, multi-volumes. Go to the library. If you don't have it on your computer, go to the library. They have it in the library. Not the Jewish Encyclopedia, but the Encyclopedia of Judaica. And you will find this very information that I have given to you. Okay? Now, notice on page 5, 
Now, I'm not going to read all this to you. you. You can read, so... All right, I'm going to start in the early, at the top of the page, in the early Middle Ages when the consonantal text of the, what is that, Bible was supplied with vowel points to facilitate its correct traditional reading. The vowel points for Adonai with one variation, a Shiva with the initial Yod of yod heh vav heh Instead of the hot top, pata, however you say that, <laughs> under the Aleph of Adonai, that is the, when you say hot top, pata, that is the vowel point. That is a vowel point. A vowel point. Okay? It's like a little dot or some kind of little. Okay? <laughs> under Aleph Adonai was used for Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. Y H V H. It says W H there. Thus producing the form Yehovah, Yehovah. When Christian scholars of Europe first began to study Hebrew, I'm talking about the Jewish scribes did it on purpose. They did it on purpose. So that when the uh, Christian scholars of Europe first began to study Hebrew, they did not understand what this really meant. And they they introduced the hybrid name Jehovah. In order to avoid pronouncing even the sacred name Adonai for yod heh vav heh the custom was later introduced of saying simply in the Hebrew Hashim. They got to a place they wouldn't even say Adonai. They just called it, said the name, or Hashim. You with me here? Even in such an expression as, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of Yahweh, Psalm 118, 26, the avoidance of pronouncing the name yod heh heh is generally described to a sense of reverence. More precisely, it was caused by a misunderstanding of the third commandment, Exodus 27 and Deuteronomy 5.11, as meaning, Thou shalt not take the name of Yahweh thy God in vain, whereas it really means you shall not swear falsely by the name of Yahweh your God. So because of their extreme misinterpretation of that passage in Exodus 20 verse 7 and Deuteronomy they said we can't we're not to say the name so we'll say Adonai and then they got to a place they said we're not going to say Adonai we're going to say Hashim just the name and they these scribes took literally the vowel points of Adonai and they placed them in yod heh vav heh coming up with this hybrid name Yehovah that is even in Strong's Concordance you understand now watch this if, let's say, we, we can't rest the, the, the I'm going to talk, to a law, like, talk like a lawyer now. We can't rest the burden of proof on one document. Okay, and I didn't do that. Because what if this Encyclopedia Judaica is inaccurate in this statement I just read to you? Okay. I mean, if they, if they interjected Yahweh in certain places it shouldn't have been. And took Yahweh out and put Adonai in substitution to that in a certain place. Come on. Then how can I possibly stand on this and say this is it? But just for your information. So what I did, I went on, the, on my computer in a Strong's lexicon. And I went to Exodus chapter 6. Where it used the name Jehovah. Or Jehovah. And Strong's, who wrote Strong's Concordance, has tried... Through the, he tried through the years to fix this problem. Okay, if you're not sure in your English Bible what name for God is being used, you have to get a Strong's Concordance or a Lexicon to find out what name is behind the English word. You understand? Unless you can read Hebrew and Aramaic. In Strong's Concordance, or Strong's Lexicon, it says concerning the word Yehovah, in the King James Jehovah, it says that it's yod hey vav hey. Are you are you with me? But it's pronounced Jehovah. But he goes on to say, it's not known how. He says it's it's not pronounced. He said it's not pronounced Jehovah, and he sends you to Adonai. The word Adonai. And he says they got the vowel points from Adonai and interjected that into yod heh vav Strong's concordance or Strong's lexicon says that himself. 
Are you with me? So all these people are going to say, Jehovah is the name of God. Just pull out your little paper and start preaching to them. Uh, you want to know the name of God? It's Jesus. Jesus is the name of God. The name which is above every name. yod heh vav Hey, Elohim. Yahweh. El Shaddai. El Elyon. Hell. It's all in Him. Are y'all awake? Just for your information. Now, having shared that with you, let's go over here. And let's look at some of these plurals then. I haven't read anything to you in Genesis or Exodus 3 or 6. Ten minutes to go. That says anything about a multiplicity of persons, have I? Then for me to say that there is a multiple, multiple personality of God or a multiple person, multiple persons in one God is not biblical because the Bible doesn't say it. On, Did you hear what I said? The Bible doesn't say it. You have got to read into the Bible the plural term Elohim, the word for God in creation. You have to read into that term that there are persons because God does not say it. You have to read that there's a multiplicity of persons into terms like us, into terms like we, into terms like our, plural terms. You have to read persons into those terms to come up with persons. Because God doesn't say persons. All the stuff of God is in Jesus. We call it the substance. Literal translation is all the stuff of God. Everything that God is, all his stuff is in Jesus. All his attributes, his names, etc. is all in Jesus Christ. He's not the second person. It's all in him. And the word God, Theotis, is a plural word. Again, it's not plural in persons. It's all that God is. You can't limit God to one attribute, one characteristic. When even his names show you he's androgynous, he's male and female in his characteristic, his attribute. So, you'd have to read persons into it. You have to put your glasses on of the early church fathers who believed in the doctrine of the Trinity. You have to see that in there because it is not in your Bible. So every time you come across the word we, us, our, these pluralisms, don't let it throw you. Don't, make, don't let it make you afraid. Because your God is one God. But he has many attributes and many characteristics. Now I'm going to try to show you by Genesis what I'm talking about. Go back to Genesis 1 then. In the beginning, God. That word's plural. Now I would have a problem here if the verse said in the beginning, God, this multiplicity of persons created the heaven and the earth if it said that then I'd have to say that but it don't say that it just said Elohim what you need to understand is the word Elohim is also used for pagan deities in the Bible false gods are called Elohim but it doesn't say that there are three bells. It doesn't say that there are three asteroids. It doesn't say, come on somebody. It doesn't say there are three persons of Baal. And they're called Elohim. So why when you get to God, you want to make three persons out of Him. When pagan gods are not three persons. There are no such thing as three bells. Give God some praise in the house. Has nothing to do with persons. In the beginning, God, Elohim, plural, created the heaven and the earth. Now let's go to 26. And God said, Elohim said, say with me, Elohim, Elohim. the creator God. Woo, hallelujah. This God said, let us. Who is he talking to? When he says, let us. 
Why doesn't he say, let me or let I? He says, let us. Okay, here we go. People who believe in persons are going to jump on that and say, there they are. There's a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. All three persons right there. You have to read that into that. Okay, here we go. And Elohim said, Elohim is plural. It has to be. Said, let us. That one God with plural attributes says, let us. Watch this. It has to be. Make man in our image. After our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So Elohim, plural term for God, created man in his own image. Created ish in his own image. God created he, him, male and female, created he, them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and do it. With me? Say praise the Lord. Lord. Chapter 2, verse 18, and the Lord God. Again, there's that inserting of the word Lord. Yahweh. God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. Let me jump down. Let's talk about uh, verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman or is shy because she was taken out of man. Are you with me? Say praise the Lord. What you have here then is God created them, them plural, in his single, singular image. So you've got the woman characteristic of God and you've got the male characteristic of God right there. But they are created in his image. So Elohim, I am offering you. you, and, And listen. You can take it if you want to. I don't. This is what I believe. I believe what you have then is the masculine Yahweh attribute of God working together with Shaddai attribute of God, the feminine attribute of God working together. Those attributes working together. And he said, let us make man in our image. God created man in his own image. He goes on and said he created male and Female in his image. One image. But a male and a female gender. (coughs) Androgynous God. Having both male and female. Yahweh masculine. El Shaddai female. In concert together. He then becomes Elohim. As Yahweh and as El Shaddai together. He is Elohim the creator. Come on. Out of him comes forth life. He births life. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the word there, breath, is plural. He gave him physical and spiritual life. So this Elohim God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him. Him. Look at this. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Where did Isha come from? Isha came out of Ish. Isha means a womb man. Or derived from man. The womb man came out of the man. So Adam is what? He was created in the image of God. And there was only one Adam. There's only one God. If God created him in his image and there was only one, then that, 
Thank you. That means there's only one God, one man. But out of that one man, that androgynous man, came forth a woman out of his side. So that even Adam was androgynous, having both male and female attributes inside of him until God put him to sleep and said, I'm going to take out of you a rib and I'm going to make a woman, a womb man, an Isha. So that I believe what you have is you have the female and the male. Characteristics and attributes of God being spoken of when he said, let us. Now I have to check this out. And I have to really get into the words, but I'm just going to give it to you just for thought. God created man in his image. Can, it could be translated, is creating man in his image. Come on, it's an ongoing process. Now hang with me here. Are y'all awake? Whew, God's awesome. See, he showed, it, he showed you in Adam what he did. He took out of Adam a woman. Jesus, our God has male and female attributes. And he created them in his singular image. Are you here tonight? Do you understand? Give God some praise. So, watch this. I don't, I'm, how much time do I got, brother? Okay, I've gone one minute over. What happened then? This is so awesome, man. I just get so excited, man. <laughs> Nothing like him. He took out of a man, he took the woman's side of the man. Said, Ish, out of Ish comes Isha, the womb man that came out of the man. The woman was in the man. He took out of the man a rib, a rib. And the word rib literally could be translated, he took the curvy part out of him. Woo! He took the curvy part out of Adam and he said, here she is, man. And Adam said, woo, woman, Isha. I think he probably almost had a heart attack and laid there for three weeks, man. <laughs> he said, this is what a Isha looks like. This is what a womb man looks like. This is what a woman looks like. My womb. The curvy part of me. Woo, God. Somebody say praise the Lord. I know y'all are all, <laughs> I know I'm in church. But you're Pentecostals. And I know how you are in church. You want to act all pious. And you don't know nothing about what I'm talking about. But when you get home, that's why you got so many kids running around. When the lights go out, the, oh yeah. Yeah, we know how you are here. But So now some of you men are going to say, come over here next to me, the curvy part of me. Hallelujah. <laughs> And when they came in union together, they became one flesh. They became one again. Somebody say, praise the Lord. And I got to quit. But I'm just trying to show you that his names show different characteristics and attributes of God Almighty. And when he says, let us, it doesn't mean there's persons. Somebody say, praise the Lord. And I'm just going to run down a few other possibilities that you're going to find in a lot of one God teaching books, okay? Some people will say it's angels that he was talking to when he said, let us. But I got a problem with that. Because I got a question for you. If he created us in the image of angels, then how could he say he created us in his image? See, he didn't create me in the image of angels and in the image of God. He created me and you, woman, in the image of the one God. He didn't create you in the image of an angel. He created you in the image of God. You are a son of God. Do you understand that? You are a son of God. 
You are the offspring of God himself. He didn't create you in the image of an angel. He created you in the image of Elohim. He made you a little lower than Elohim. He didn't make you originally below the angels. He made you a little lower than Elohim. Because he created you in his image, not in the image of angels. So I, I, I wouldn't agree with that. That it's angels. Ephesians 1.11, the Bible says that he does everything after the counsel of his own will. So if you don't like this androgynous teaching that I gave you, which I believe that's the truest biblical way to approach that, then you might use Ephesians 1.11 says he does everything after the counsel of his own will. All right? So he counseled his will. Us could be his will. Possible? Could be? Because I talk to myself all the time. And I was created in his image. So if I can talk to myself, cannot God talk to himself? You ever do that, Brother Mark? Say, you say, you talk to yourself, Brother Mark. Now you're not supposed to do that, Brother Mark. Yeah. <laughs> I created, why well, can't God? Well, the Bible says he does everything after the counsel of his own will. Hallelujah. After the counsel of, the counsel of his own will. Right? <coughs> Could be. Then other people will translate this and say, well, this Elohim, this plural word Elohim, and us, and we, and our, speaks of his majesty. You know. He's so majestic. Uh, he's, you know, anyway. But, got a problem with that too. The, plura the plurality of his majesty. I got a problem with that. Because if you look in that documentation that I gave you, it says the Jewish people know nothing about God in connection with a plurality of majesty. So let's get with it. Let's get real here, all right? It could be his attributes. I believe that. Let us make man. Well, how did he create the heavens and the earth? How did he create man? His wisdom. You with me? His wisdom, his power, his female, male characteristic attribute, working in concert together, Elohim, bringing him forth. His attributes, I believe that one. Are you here tonight? Come on, I got to hurry. I believe in this androgynous teaching. I believe that Ephesians 1.11 could be also true. They could all be true, except angels and majesty. At the same time. But also it could be a reference to the future son of God. Romans 5.14 talks about. Let me just put it this way. That when God created Adam. He made Adam to look like Jesus. So when Jesus came into the world. God knew what Jesus would look like. And so God made Adam to look just like Jesus. If you want to know what Adam looked like, Romans 5.14 says he looked just like Jesus. So when he said, let us make man, it could be a prophetic word about the, the coming, the future coming of the Son of God. I'm going to make you like him. In eternity, though, the Bible says in Hebrews 4 that everything was finished from before the foundation of the world. Revelation 18 says this. He says that Jesus was slain from before the foundation of the world. So in eternity, it's already done. So God can speak as if it's already done, that he's already come in the form of the Son of God. And there he is in eternity, the finished work having been completed, sitting there and says, now I'm going to create you just like us. They're going to look just like us, just like me in human form, sitting on this throne. It's already done in eternity. Are you here tonight? Could also be a reference to us, the Word, or the Logos. Because in the beginning, the Word was with God. The Word was God. The plan, the thought, the blueprint, the Word was with God. When you, call God, when you say God is the Word, you're talking about God in activity. So He can speak as the Word. Let us. 
as the plan, as the thought, as the blueprint, and make man after that. Do you understand? Not as a separate person, but as the Word of God. <sighs> I wish you'd leave me alone. Know this, it, it never speaks when you talk about the plural words, terms, names for God. It never speaks of persons. It can speak of his different roles though. Different roles, different modes. Are you here tonight? It could also be a reference to the church. Because it is possible to translate the verse that God created man in his image as God is creating man in his image. So, prophetically he says, I'm going to make you to look like the church. The us could be the saints. The us could be the congregation. The us could be the righteous. So all of the above, I believe, could, I believe are true, to be honest with you, except angels and majesty. Give God some praise. <clears throat> so in the New Testament, when you come to Jesus, woo, God, you come to the body of God. You come, you see Jesus, and what you see is everything that God is, all the stuff of God. Everything that God is, is in Jesus Christ bodily. That's it, man. So when you come to the New Testament, you see Jesus as a man, and you see him as God. Not two persons. You see two, let me put it this way. I really don't like the term nature because nature really comes from, anyway, anyway. And I don't want to throw you off. But what you have is Jesus is man, 100% man, and he is 100% God at the same time. And there's not two persons, but there is the Spirit of God manifest in the flesh. Not a plurality of persons, but I'll use the term plurality of natures. There is definitely a two-ness to Jesus, but it's not persons. It's deity and humanity. When you come to the New Testament... Okay, give God some praise. Yeah. Hallelujah. I thank God for the word. I thank God for the truth. See, listen to me. I didn't have to twist anything in the Bible to teach you what I just taught you. I didn't have to read into anything in the Bible to teach you what I just taught you. I just executed right there by the names and by the text itself. And let the Bible interpret itself. Are you with me here? There is no multiple persons in God. No multiple personality in God. God is a spirit with multiple attributes. That's why he had to reveal himself in these different names. To show you everything that he is. But all that, all that he is, is in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Give the Lord some praise. <laughs> Father God, tonight in your mighty name. I just praise you for your word, Jesus.